when was the last time you sat in complete stillness? I'm not talking about the moments before you drift off to dreamland or those early morning hours when you're trying to convince yourself to rise from bed and face the world. I also don't mean being still while watching Stranger Things or during the morning commute. What I am talking about is the intentional stillness without mental distraction. If you're like me, it might be difficult to recall such a time. And part of that is because the world we live in today doesn't reward stillness. In most cases, it's considered an act of laziness because in order to get ahead, you've got to constantly be doing, building, making, and creating. There's always something else that needs to be tended to, and we simply don't have the time to sit. And even if we carved out some time for it, what happens can be quite uncomfortable. The mind races as you consider your to-do list, or maybe thoughts come to mind that are shocking or surprising to you. Studies suggest that stress levels are higher than they've ever been. Technology has given us instant access to everything, which means that those hundreds of emails need to be answered now, and the project your boss gave you today needed to be finished yesterday. 20 years ago, you may have punched a clock and left your workload on your desk to be addressed the following day, but that's no longer the case. How many times have you foregone dinner or sat up late at night due to work? Or what about reaching for your phone or tablet every time you hear that little ding signifying the receipt of a new message? And let's not forget those other things that take space in our lives like Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, and other platform that works diligently to keep us entranced in the never-ending opportunity for distraction. Who has the time to sit still and meditate? Or even if not to meditate, just to put your feet in the ocean or take a warm bath and let the mind wander? But you might be surprised to learn that while we say that we don't have enough time, experts have determined that we work less than we used to, but perceive ourselves to be busier than ever. Being still isn't a new concept. It's been practiced for thousands of years by people looking to gain better understanding of themselves and the world around them, to find solutions to difficult problems, to better appreciate what they have, to take respite from a world of high demand. And the benefits don't end there. Over the past many years, researchers have determined that meditation has a positive impact on Alzheimer's disease, heart health, stress levels, and more. Yet we still can't find the time to practice stillness. This concept of stillness is one of the themes of today's episode. We'll talk with author Ryan McMahon, whose most recent book, Sun King, emphasizes the importance of stillness as a way to reclaim balance in our lives, improve understanding of the self, and foster creativity. He'll talk about how a chance encounter would set him on a path of self-discovery and create a thirst to better understand the world around him. We discuss his firsthand experience with how emotional trauma presented as physical pain in his body and what he did to gain relief. And why, after you finish listening to this podcast, you might want to put your eye gadget away and head for the nearest forest. But before we begin, I want to tell you that this episode contains discussion of what some might consider some pretty out there stuff. Ryan talks a lot about metaphysics and the esoteric, and even if these things aren't necessarily your bag, I'm certain you'll gain something from sticking around. As author and biochemist Isaac Asimov once charged, your assumptions are your windows in the world. Scrub them off every once in a while, or the light won't come in. My name is Ryan Halverson, and this is The Book Builders on Books and Authors. Ryan grew up in Georgia with deciduous forest all around. He remembers spending a great deal of time outside, traipsing through the woods, playing with a slingshot, fishing, you know, all the things you might expect of a kid from the 1980s whose playground consisted of the nature that surrounded him. That kind of, I don't know, that always kind of opened up this self-awareness, like my own inner dialogue, my own connection to self. Even though he grew up immersed in nature, he didn't give much thought to the world around him, aside from the idea that the forest satisfied his introverted tendencies. But at the age of 19, he recalls a situation that caused him to alter his perceptions of himself and the world around him. I was dating a woman who was seeing a clairvoyant, a psychic, if you want to call it that, and... She kept coming, coming, you know, home and saying all these things that involved me. And I was just a total skeptic. And I was just like, this has got to stop. You know, this is, this is kind of like a lot of mumbo jumbo. And one day I, uh, I found this post-it note on, on the mirror and it had this woman's, uh, I knew the woman's name and it had her number on it. So I called it, set up an appointment and I, I went there to see her basically arrogantly to like tell her to stop filling my girlfriend's head with all this crap, you know? And, uh, and my life changed on that day. 
my idea of reality just was totally changed and was totally shattered. And I really talk about this in my first book. That's what my first book is kind of a lot about, my relationship with this woman. Her name was Antoinette. And my, what I think happened is my, my pineal gland just got flooded with, with, you know, the physiology, the chemistry of like DMT, if you want to call it that, or all these other chemicals. The pineal gland is a pea-sized mass of tissue in the brain, often referred to as the third eye, that secretes melatonin. Melatonin is a hormone that is primarily associated with the body's sleep-wake cycles, though it's been said to affect aging, reproduction, and other biological functions. And the DMT Ryan mentions is a psychoactive chemical known to cause intense visions. It was induced by this woman, and it, was, it wasn't intentional. And so what happened was I was just conversing with this woman. I was pretty just like a punk kid, you know, like kind of just trying to tell her what's up. And the whole room filled with light. And, and all this light started emanating from her and coming out to where she basically disappeared and this, the entire room was just filled with beautiful, colorful, uh, auric light. And then what happened after that, this kind of happened, this went on for a few, like a, a couple minutes. I saw these people come through, these, these beings come through and they were, she was a woman and, and these were, were men, you know, bearded men, um, actually, like what I would call like different cultures, I could tell that they weren't they weren't all the same. They weren't all just like Caucasian or whatever. I was like shocked, you know. I was I was a little bit scared, but the light was so beautiful and mesmerizing that I could feel that it was like benevolent. And I I left there. We talked about it, like she and I talked about it, because it's just this kind of thing happens with her. Um, and I left there like a whole different person. I was just like, my whole reality was, was different. And I was just, I couldn't quite make sense of it for a while. Uh, for one, I was 19 years old. So my, my ability to think in abstract terms or understand the metaphysical world was, was small, you know? And so I, I just thought, man, how is this possible? You know, what, how is this happening? And it really opened me up and opened up my mind and I even say it, it, to some degree it opened up my heart and, it, and I just started studying I just started reading everything metaphysical everything religious everything spiritual and I was just like I have to figure out what's happening in my life Ryan's book is woven with several threads and concepts that he spent a great deal of time studying since having that experience with Antoinette and what I find especially interesting about Ryan's perceptions of these concepts is that he's come to various conclusions based on etymology or the study of the origin of words. Here he describes one of those concepts and his path toward understanding it. The human body is the temple of God. The word temple is the same root word as tempo, which is the same root word as time. And the L-E, the temple or the L, is also the same resonant word for Elohim, which is basically means messengers of God. So temple literally means the message in time of God. And I, kind of, I look at the human body as being the signature of that. And we just don't, in our Western world, we don't always acknowledge that. We, you know, we have a body image or we're extremely body conscious and it might be for a more vain reason, you know, like I want to look like a celebrity or I want to be the perfect model or or the opposite occurs where you just totally ignore the temple and you, um, you know, you indulge in, in bad thinking or bad habits that uh, make the temple, uh, for lack of a better word, I'll say unclean. And I, I look at the human body as being a, a signature of light that is actually uh, vibrating at such a frequency that we feel it as being dense or three dimensional. But ultimately it's, it is a manifestation of light, and so is mind or, or, you know, the mental capacity, and, of course, so is the emotional capacity, and, and of course, all this is sustained by spirit. Speaking of the body, in your book, you describe how you became intimately aware of how mistreating or ignoring it significantly impacted your life. Can you describe this experience? I was an athlete my whole life. Like, I was a pretty good athlete. I, I played all kinds of sports, like football, basketball, soccer, surfing. And 
What happened to me when I was 19, when this whole thing happened, is that I had, my whole identity was based on my, um, my athleticism. Um, I was good, so I was a bit like cocky and arrogant in that way. And when I met Antoinette, I, I had been suffering for about six to eight months a severe um, back problem. And it was also, it started in my heel, like in my foot. I had severe pain in my foot. I couldn't walk correctly, and I had severe pain in my back that were related. And long story short, it just got worse, and I got to the point where my whole athletic career ended. And it was a shock to my my ego and a shock to my identity. It made me focus on the body. And so I've been through a, an incredibly long list of chronic <laughs> chronic pain that has dealt with very, very deep levels of the human being. And I could say, oh, well, they're expressing themselves in the body. But what I've learned, uh, and a lot of people may not uh, agree or understand this, but what I've learned is that the body is connected to, to spirit in such a way that your, your deeper being, your, your, your deeper mind, if you want to call it, your like subconscious mind, uh, expresses itself through the temple, which is the human body. And my temple was needing to be fixed, you know, needed to be uh, cleaned, needed to be taken care of, and needed to become aware of its sacred or divine qualities. And that's why I had, I, I have had such a struggle with the body. So I have definitely, I mean, I've, I've had my fair share of uh, debilitating on the ground for months at a time, severe pain. So that made me focus on the body and, and go through these shifts in awareness to, to really go, okay, what is going on? Like, why do I have this chronic pain? Why is this so intense? Why are, why are doctors not able to help me? Why is this not an easy fix? You know, why can't I just go, go do some physical therapy and be done in a couple of weeks? You know, it's, mm-hmm. been, it's been like 21, 22 years of, uh, of extreme concentration in order to make these shifts in the body. And that whole practice of doing that is actually a spiritual maneuver, whether you acknowledge it or not. After experiencing very little improvement with traditional approaches to pain relief, he decided to seek out the guidance of a craniosacral therapist. For those of you who don't know what that is, craniosacral therapy aims to relieve pain and tension through gentle manipulations of the skull. So what happened to me with with cranial sacral work um, is uh, this wonderful practitioner. She's here in, in San Diego, Shelly Reiki. She, um, she's intuitive herself, so, but she's basically able to put my body, put myself into the parasympathetic nervous system state, which is, um, that's the only state physiologically that your body can actually induce healing. And so the parasympathetic basically is the rest, digest state for the nervous system. And our lives, you know, I can't speak for everybody, but most, most of our lives are like kind of like on the go. Uh, consciousness is directed outward. You're constantly doing one task after another. And this is the antithesis of the rest digest uh, state. This is the sympathetic nervous system. And this is the, actually the fight or flight mode. And to try to make this simple, um, I realized through this process of doing cranial sacral work and emotional energy work with horses, actually, I realized that um, I had suffered a a fair amount of emotional and physical trauma as a very young child. Only thing is, is I just didn't know that I had suffered that stuff because it was sort of locked into my, my energy body and my, I guess you'd say my subconscious mind or deeper parts of myself. And the cranial sacral put me into that state of the parasympathetic, excuse me, the parasympathetic nervous system, the rest digest state. And these, these uh, emotions and images and events came bubbling up to the surface. And, um, you know, some of them are really, really profound. And the, the, this is really no different than, you know, doing uh, in psychoanalysis or psychotherapy, doing the classic Freudian or Jungian um, shadow work you know, where you're, you're actually willingly and intending to go into your, your darkness 
and we all have darkness. It's not a, an evil thing. It's just a part of uh, being a human being. Go into the darkness and take a look at it with more power or with a higher vantage, or you could say with an adult mind. And so the subconscious is constantly, constantly, like every day, asking us to integrate things that have been hard or damaging or traumatic for us, integrate them into the conscious mind. And we look at this and we think that it, when this kind of stuff happens, we think it's like destiny or divine intervention. Um, and to some degree, maybe it is because the human being is so magical that it does this. But, you know, Carl Jung, or I think it was Freud, actually said that nothing can come to an end in the unconscious. And what he's implying there is that everything, all of our healing has to be made conscious. We have to be able to look at it, shine our, our light of the current moment on it in order to understand it. And cranial sacral is a wonderful avenue for doing this as long as the practitioner actually knows what they're doing and that they can guide you through this stuff in a, you know, in a, a let's say, like a safe, comfortable, safe environment. All right. So when you had this work done, you mentioned that various images popped into your head and memories bubbled to the surface. What happened next? What happened with cranial sacral work is that it actually, in those moments of dealing with these emotions and this, this trauma, uh, my body shifted all on its own. It would just sort of unravel some of this tension. It didn't, it didn't heal me completely, but um, that's because my, my, uh, my issues were so, so deep and long long lasting I needed I needed more work but I could feel this actually being an effective mode and your typical doctor you know just your typical osteopath or, or whatever they typically don't acknowledge your subconscious mind or your emotions uh, or even just you know like any kind of PTSD any kind of trauma as being something they address when healing pain and I, I would say in my, this one chapter of my book, I would say this is like the only thing to address, you know, it's, or maybe not the only thing, but the most fundamental thing to address when people have chronic pain, especially when they don't actually know why. Ryan's experience almost gives visions of people whose pain was miraculously healed after taking a palm to the forehead by a holy roller. But what he's talking about is something that many researchers, especially within the realm of manual therapies like massage, rolfing, or trigger point, are placing increased focus. And what these researchers are finding is that chronic pain may have associations with emotional trauma. For example, something that happened to you in your childhood that you may not even remember might get stored in the body because at the time the brain wasn't able to work through it properly. So in a way, it's thought of as a defense mechanism that allows a person to move past difficulty or trauma when they don't possess the skills to deal with it at the time. Many experts describe this as emotional holding. And the reason this study is led by researchers in manual therapy like osteopath and founder of craniosacral therapy John Upledger is because people often experience releases during massage or manual manipulation. For example, people report experiencing an unexpected emotion, say when a therapist works on a specific area like the nose or the low back, or like Ryan, images or long lost memories pop up out of nowhere. And while it doesn't happen for everyone, the therapy results in an emotional release and suddenly the physical pain dissipates or disappears completely. So that's a brief cursory overview of the science and the mechanisms behind this type of therapy, but I'm curious to understand what your perspective is on it. The way, the way that I look at this is that the emotions is basically energy in motion, so emotion. And so our energy, we're constantly, uh, you know, using energy every day, and we have these patterns, you know, where we, we rest and we, we go and we we. we we, you know, go in all these, these patterns and these patterns of, of energy and motion move or flow in wave, waveforms. And it's just like sort of damming up a river, or if you want to call it that, is that if, if you're holding on to certain things in your emotional body or, you know, even in your mind, in your mental body, they can cause this energy to, to not flow through the body. And, I would, I also hold the belief that that we're we're just basically like swimming around in energy 
and an intelligently organized and conscious energy. The whole planet is intelligent. The solar system is built on harmonics that are, you know, mathematically and musically beautifully orchestrated. And so is the galaxy and the cosmos. And we're no different. We are a, a reflection of that harmony. And so when the energy is not flowing through the body because we're holding it up somehow, we're just standing in our own way. And it manifests as as some sort of pain. It, it can be just a mental pain where it just makes you frustrated or it can be deep, deeply involved in the body, which, again, to me is the temple. Ryan feels that it's of utmost importance for everyone to gain a greater self-awareness so that it becomes much easier to process and release trauma and pain. So we have to learn how to be, be self-aware enough to allow the energy to flow through us like, like it's meant to do, like, you know, like the wind blowing through trees. It's just supposed to go through and it's supposed to rustle the leaves and strengthen the tiny little stems of each little leaf as wind, you know, blows through. And this makes the entire tree or entire organism much more stable and much more strong. And I think the human body is exactly like that. This brings up another of the concepts that you discuss in your book, and that's balance and harmony. And you believe, like many thought leaders and researchers from a variety of disciplines, that many of us today are out of balance, which results in increased potential for depression, anxiety, and other neuroses. You suggest that the current go, go, go society and a disconnect with the natural world are at the root of these imbalances. Can you explain this? I'm of the belief that, that all of our neuroses, like all of them, all of our pathologies stem from our antipathy to nature because I believe that nature is our greatest teacher. And I believe that there was a time in the course of recent human history when we live so much more harmonic or so much more in tune with nature and we didn't have this antipathy or this, this sort of resistance to it or fear of it. And so we didn't have all of these neuroses. What about technology? Do you think that it plays a role in the neuroses and pathologies that you mentioned? Cell phones and, and, and computers and um, this type of technology, it's actually not solving our problems. It's just putting them off and, and maybe even perpetuating them to, to, to be more explosive in the future. So I'm not saying don't use all of those things. I'm saying use all of those things with a deep knowledge of who you are so that when you use technology, you understand how to wield it in a, in a, in a good way, you know, in a, in a balanced way, where it's not hurting you, it's not hurting the society you live in, it's not hurting the people around you. On a related note, and you allude to this when you say that technology may harm us more than help us, is that our modern advancements make it so easy to always be on the go. For instance, when it comes to work, we used to punch the clock and that was that. Whatever you had to finish would be there when you punched in the next day, but that's no longer how things are. Thanks to technology, we no longer leave work at work. And in order to be considered a productive member of society, you must always be doing something. It seems like everybody today is all about the hustle. And conversely, sitting still or taking rest is not rewarded and is often considered lazy and unproductive. And personally, whenever I take time to simply sit and do nothing, I always feel that I'm wasting my time and that I should at least put a load of laundry in or answer another email. But I'm guessing you'd suggest we should try a different approach. Yeah, because, I mean, basically, if you just, if you're able to step back from a, a, a you know, a um, objective viewer point and you just look at what you're actually doing, your daily pattern is, you're just constantly putting off rest. And so if you, if that dawns on you where you're like, oh my God, I'm just, for the last 25 years, I've just been constantly putting off what I need. I've been constantly, what you're doing is you're denying self. You're, you're, you're sort of refusing to care for yourself. You're refusing to love yourself. And you're going, oh, I'm going to do that tomorrow. Oh, I'm going to do that tomorrow. Oh, I'm going to do that tomorrow. And this is a classic case of neuroses, right? I mean, it doesn't have to be, a, you know, it doesn't make you a terrible person. I mean, I do it. I think everybody does it. We jump on the hamster wheel for a while and, and we forget that we need to be still. And that's why it hurts. That's why it manifests in our body eventually as pain or, you know, or problems like other neurotic problems like 
just emotional problems or mental problems where you're like constantly pissed off at the world, you know, or you're, you're constantly angry every day. You have to get up and go to your job and you have to act like you're not, but you, you walk in that door and you're like, pissed. you know, it's, it's eventually it will, um, it will snap and you will be forced to sit still, you know, hopefully not in some sort of hospital bed. And I know a lot of people and I oftentimes struggle with this myself is that sitting still seems like it's almost a waste of time, but wouldn't you agree that there are many situations in which sitting still can actually help you become more creative and productive? Yeah. And you know, this, this is the same thing with all people. It's funny. Um, those flashes of insight, you know, great scientists will tell you, um, how, how did you come up with this theorem, you know, or how did you, how are you able to see this particular abstract idea that doesn't actually exist? You know, it's somewhere out in the cosmos. How are you able to tap into it? And, and they'll tell you like their greatest moments of discovery, they come in flashes and they go, well, what were you doing? Well, I was in the, I was, I was dreaming or I was, uh, I was, um, you know, staring out the window or I was taking a shower, you know, and I had this flash. And the, the reason why this happens is because you're disconnecting from the left brain, which is the intellect, the, the part that chops up reality into small, convenient little pieces. And you're going into the right brain, which is where the imagination exists and also our intuition. And, um, and I, I'll also say that the, the human being actually has seven senses, not five. So we have the intuition and the imagination are actually our senses as well. We need to acknowledge that. And so when you live in a place where you access your right brain and your left brain, they actually work together. You have this male, female magnetic electric uh, connection or, or marriage or a chemical wedding that truly shifts your consciousness. It, it can shift you into a higher state of awareness. And this always comes through the imagination and the intuition and and it's the it's something that we can practice we can we can be there you know and the the people that are already naturally there are like the artists the musicians the writers the poets they li- they kind of live most of their life in the right brain and sometimes life gets really hard for them because they're in, they're actually imbalanced as well because you you need to live and it's challenging believe me it's you need to live in a balanced way but you know, the spirit speaks to us and comes to us in in mysterious and magical ways because the right brain, if you want to call it that, the, the part of ourselves that is associated with the right brain truly is tapped into infinity. It's tapped into infinite knowledge and infinite consciousness. And one another one other thing I'd like to say about that is that we we typically approach knowledge in the Western world in in the in a very rudimentary way that's not really that effective. And that is left brain, go out and grasp and acquire, like, you know, dig, dig through things and, and sort of keep looking over and, over and over and over and over and over again until you acquire a new layer of knowledge. And this is a very slow way to acquire knowledge and it acquires knowledge in very small slivers or small chunks. And the other way to acquire knowledge which we are designed to do if we just be taught it or be aware of it. Like Rudolf Steiner teaches this in his Waldorf school and a lot of his writings um, is, is an apophatic approach to knowledge. And what apophatic knowledge is, is a deconstruction of the things that you know and a clearing out of the thoughts that you have and allowing larger, you know, intuitive slivers of knowledge to move in. And this, again, this is meditation. This is why, you know, the mystics are so mystical because they have knowledge that is so incredibly hard to describe because it's it's really, truly, like, beyond language. You know, it's beyond symbols. And so they have it, they know it, but it's very hard to transmit to other people. So what they do instead of teach you knowledge is they teach you how to get knowledge, right? They, they, instead of handing a man a fish, they teach you how to fish. And they go, oh, I can't, 
I can't really give you the knowledge I have, but I can show you how to get it. And this apophatic approach to knowledge is so powerful. And this is what we need to bring back into our society and into our culture because it balances the way that we live. It balances the way that we think. You know, it allows us to deconstruct paradigms that don't work anymore. And there's so many of them. Like, like I said, quantum mechanics, atomic physics, it's a totally, it's a broken system. And it, it just deals with like explosion based technology. Uh, uh, it's totally inefficient. And nature shows us something totally different where the planets sustain themselves. They spin on their own axis. They rotate in their own orbits. And the sun is going through the cosmos at a massive speed all on its own. And it's, it's not burning up energy. It's not, it's not huffing and puffing and, and about to deplete itself. No, it's renewing. It's self-renewing. It's self-sustaining. And this is what nature is. It's a constant, infinite process of efficient, self-sustaining energy. And we can be that same way as humans, as individuals, if we tap into and balance our, our approach to reality and the way we think and the way we live and, and, and basically use an apophatic approach to knowledge as well as the standard um, grasping, acquiring, intellectual approach to knowledge. All right, well, we're just about out of time. But before I let you go, I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind sharing with us the one thing you suggest that we all do to bring greater balance and harmony into our lives. One of the things that you can do to seek balance and equilibrium in your life is spend time in nature alone in some sort of meditative or harmonic state, like simply just sitting, sitting in front of the ocean is, is amazing. You know, take your shoes off and put your feet on the ground and the, the electric current of the earth will actually penetrate through your body and will help stabilize you. Get your hands dirty. Go, go do things. Hike, you know, hug trees, smell the forest, um, swim, surf, skate, snow, and just be. And that's our show. Many thanks to Ryan for sharing his unique experiences and thoughtful insights with us. If you like what he had to say and want to learn more, check out his book, Sun King, on Amazon. But make sure you pick up the one written by Ryan McMahon. He's filled it with more of his life experiences as well as the research he's done on metaphysics and the esoteric. And plus, and one of the unexpected highlights I discovered while reading it is he talks a lot about Scotland, Ireland, Egypt, and other fascinating countries with incredibly rich and almost mythical histories. Also, I'd like to thank you for taking the time out of your day to listen to the show. I'm Ryan Halverson, and this has been the Book Builders on Books and Authors. Now go take a hike. No, seriously, do as Ryan says. Go put your feet in the dirt, hug a tree, jump in the lake. It'll do you some good. Thank you.